kids in our church, but uh, we got a lot of kids here today, so praise the Lord. It's good to be with young folks. It makes you feel a little bit younger, doesn't it? Man? But today, uh, we've already read the scripture. Those of you who are, are guests with us today, we're going through the Gospel of Mark. It's the early, earliest of the Gospels. It's the shortest of the Gospels, the most succinct. But uh, the theme verse is chapter 10, verse 40, 45, where Jesus says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. The message today is, in that 8th chapter, those verses 31 through 38, on what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. What does, what does it really mean? We talk about being disciples. Jesus told us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. But what does it mean? That's what we're going to explore today. But before we do that, uh, I'll invite you to stand with me if you're able and take your hand. We're not going to pledge allegiance to the flag, but we're going to put our hands over our hearts today. And uh, as you feel your heart beating, I know today that there are things on your heart, not your physical heart, but on what the scriptures call our, our heart, our inner being, our, our mind, our heart, where our, our thoughts are and where what we contemplate on. And, and uh, ask the Lord to take things out of your heart today that would keep you from hearing what he wants to say to you. And then I know there are burdens on our hearts today. Let's take those burdens, whatever they are. And let's give them to the Lord. Father, as we stand before you today, searched by your Spirit who lives within us, those of us who are your followers, and by the presence of the Spirit who is here among us as we corporately worship, Lord, we do release to you the things that are burdening us today, people that we're praying, praying for, people that are hurting that we know, even our own burdens, our problems, whatever those are health-wise, financial-wise, whatever. God, we release those to you. And now, Lord, speak to us very clearly from your word to each one of our hearts. And may we respond in a way that you would wish and that would glorify you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Now, your part in the message today is simply this. And I want you kids to help, help us, because uh, some of us adults will probably forget it. Uh, at certain points in the message, I'm going to say, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Now, there's three points in the message today, but the one that I want to really emphasize is the last one. And that one is, a follower of Jesus is, say, I'm a follower of Jesus, not a fan of Jesus. Can you say that? I'm a follower of Jesus, not a fan of Jesus. Now, most of us are fans of a uh, college team. Their NFL's having their, their playoffs or, or a pro team or whatever. We're, we're fans, you know. Fa fans are those people that stand up in the sand, stands and, and shout and all that kind of stuff. And, but folks, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're, you're, you're not a fan of Jesus. You're a follower. You follow him. And uh, that's what the message is about today. And what we've seen already is that to be a disciple, we must abandon ourselves and unashamedly represent the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it means, if you want to sum it all up. And we've seen here, haven't we, the gospel of Mark is, is putting on display King Jesus, the, the suffering servant king. It's putting on display who, who Jesus is, he, he, his, his different characteristics. He's, he's God, he's man, but without sin, and he's God. He's fully God and fully man. He is divine and he's human. He's, he's a healer, we've seen. He, he, he does miracle after miracle after miracle. We, we see him uh, teaching. He's a wise teacher using parables, sometimes to confuse people that are around him, but to encourage those who are following him and to reveal a, a deep truth about himself and about God's plan, God the Father's plan in the world. Um, Jesus walks on water. <laughs> he walks on top of the water. Now, can, can any of you walk on water? 
Jesus walks on water, stuff that normal people don't do. And uh, here we come, right in the middle of the Gospel of Mark. We're, we're right in the middle, and it all builds up to this chapter. And uh, we, we're calling it the, the big reveal. <laughs> you know, the, the reveal parties, you know, the, whether it's going to be a boy or a girl. Here we've got the big reveal party. We're going to find out really who Jesus is. Jesus heals a blind man. And he uses that to illustrate the fact that the disciples don't see him for who he really is yet. And in verse 31, and it says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He begins to teach the disciples along with Peter that the Son of Man must suffer be rejected and killed, and then after three days, rise again. And then we come to verse 32, and it says, He spoke this word openly. Which seems to infer that up till this time, He really had not talked about the fact that He was going to suffer and He was going to die. But now, here in the middle of the gospel, it says He taught this openly. He taught it openly. No confusing parable. No metaphor. He says he's going to endure terrible things. He's going to die and he's going to rise again. He tells why he came to this earth. He came, what he came to do. And Peter, what does Peter do? Peter comes forward. Hmm. In his ignorance. <laughs> and it says he rebukes Jesus. Imagine rebuking the Lord. Peter, one of Jesus' followers, come forward. And it says he rebukes Jesus. I don't know how many of you have ever been rebuked. But it's not very pleasant. <laughs> Rebuke spe specifically is in, in truth with some grace. Confronting, correcting someone who's in the wrong. But here... Peter, a mere man, rebuking Jesus, fully God, fully man, perfect, being rebuked by Peter. Why? Because Peter didn't get it. Peter had, Peter had a different skewed view of what the Messiah was coming into the world and what he would be like. You see, Isaiah 6 verse 9 uh, prophesies several hundred years before the Messiah would come, that he would suffer and die. Peter saw Jesus as some kind of Rambo. <laughs> you ever seen the movies Rambo? That's what Pe Peter thought Jesus was going to be Rambo. <laughs> but Jesus' death is the most important, most history-challenging or changing event for every human being, including Peter. What did Jesus do here? Jeter, Jesus rebukes him back. <laughs> Look at the language Jesus uses. Get behind me, Satan! Pretty strong. <laughs> Get behind me. Peter tried to rebuke Jesus from his calling, from his purpose, why he came to the earth. He, he tries to convince Jesus to keep his life for himself and not lose it for something else. And uh, do you remember another instance where this happened? Remember Satan? Remember Satan in Matthew 4? Takes Jesus up <laughs> and he said, Jump down because <laughs> I know who you are, and he'll send his angels. And when they see this miracle, all the people will follow you. What did Jesus say? God's not to be tempted. Then he said, well, take these stones. Take these stones here and turn them into bread. Then the people will believe in you and they'll follow you. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live 
by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, Satan tried over and over again to deviate our suffering servant king from what he was there to do. And every time Jesus stood his ground, he denied to keep his life, but to lose it for our sakes. Thank God. Hallelujah. That's what Peter, in this instance, was doing. And that's why Jesus began to teach immediately after rebuking his disciples that, that, that one must take up his cross, one must deny himself to be one of his followers, his disciples. Being, being a disciple means choosing to lose yourself for the real gospel. You see, the Savior, the, the servant king, who goes against the grain and, and empowers us to do the same is the one that we follow. To, to abandon what we think this, this life, this walk looks like and to, to lose our life truly to the gospel and not save it for ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we must be a church on mission with God. That's why we're here. That's why you felt a while ago your heart beating. If you're a follower of Jesus. You're on mission with God. That's why your lungs are working today. That's why you're taking in breath. Is if you're a follower of Jesus, it's to do His mission. Being a, a disciple of our serv suffering servant king is to be a servant. Em embracing inconveniences. Embracing awkward interactions for the sake of the gospel. Let our comfort that we find in the gospel push us out, propel us to be, un to, to be in uncomfortable situations in this world, to be a representative of Jesus. Taking lunch with a co-worker who doesn't know the Lord rather than eating by yourself or with the usual group. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Losing your life, your time, <laughs> your convenience for the gospel. That's what it means. But uh, it's also easier said than done, right? <laughs> it's easier said than done. As Brother Wally has reminded us, the gospel is simple. It's not easy, though. Following and being committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ is simple, but it's not easy. Be, being a disciple of Christ isn't just losing your life for the gospel it's easier said than done. The decision to not forfeit our soul in exchange for the world, folks, is a day-by-day -day and a moment-by-moment -moment decision if we're a follower of Jesus. It's that daily struggle that you and I uh, have choosing eternity over this world. See, Christ is reminding us that the soul of a man isn't just meant for, for the joys of this world. This world is fleeting. It has an end date. We're only here for a short time. This is just a probationary period, folks. <laughs> Eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. It's after this time on the earth, and we need to keep that in focus. Christ is reminding us of this today. Satan was trying to convince Jesus otherwise, and Peter was trying to convince him the same thing. That's why he said, get behind me, Satan. Jesus slaps him in the face with some scripture. Yes, being a follower of Jesus means choosing to lose my life for the gospel. Secondly, it means choosing to keep our eyes on eternity rather than on this material world. Because at the end of the day, we can't take anything out of this world. You can't. It's ridiculous to think so, but people think that, you know. That's why they save up all this stuff. That's why they get all this stuff. People think they're going to take it. It ain't going to happen. Peter heard what Christ said about dying and suffering, and, and folks, that didn't fit with his lifestyle. <laughs> he was following Jesus around, but still didn't get the eternal purpose of Jesus. 
And Jesus not only calls Peter out, but it says he turned to his disciples and he called them all out. And he said, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, we, we get that truth in our minds, but, but we don't always feel like it in our hearts. Amen? <laughs> We know it in our head, but it doesn't quite get down here to the heart. What does it mean to fix our eyes on eternity? Simply put, to, to fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of God. Looking to Jesus. In order to focus on eternity, we have to understand and see that Jesus is greater. We must see Jesus Himself as greater. That, that He fulfills those needs. That He's worth it. Now, I'm not saying, folks, that a nice house and all this other stuff that we get to enjoy down here on this earth is bad. But I want to say, those things are easily corruptible. But lastly, and this is really the heart of the message today, being a follower, a disciple of Jesus isn't only losing your life for the gospel. And it's not only just fixing ourselves on eternity, fixing ourselves, but it's also choosing to be a courageous follower of Jesus, not a fan. Someone say, I am a follower of Jesus, not a fan of Jesus. I hope you mean that. I hope you mean that. Jesus doesn't want fans, folks. He wants followers. Followers, not fans. Christ goes to this last truth here, basically saying that if you're ashamed of me in this generation of unfaithful and sinful people, I'll be ashamed of you. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Folks, we're living in a day where, here in, even here in America, it, it pays a little bit, you know. Uh, most of you know we spent 34 years overseas as uh, missionaries, but most folks, most Christians in the world today, the majority, by the way, live in places where it, it costs. You, you become a follower of Jesus, and some countries in the world and your family will try to kill you. <laughs> you become a follower of Jesus in many places in the world and you lose your job. You can't hardly find a job. We don't experience that so much here in America, but I believe things are changing, folks. <laughs> cost, it, it costs to serve Jesus, but Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed. Jesus calls our generation his generation and our generation, adulterous. What does he mean? He's been cheated on. He's God, a very God. He's the only Savior of the world. God hurts when he sees this world, this created world, turning, on other th turning to other things. And knowing who he is and what he has done, yet still being ashamed of him and turning away from him. It breaks his heart. He loves us so deeply, so intimately, so sacrificially, yet, yet people turn away from Him. He gave His life, blood, for you and me. Over and over again, being ashamed of Him, being cowards of the gospel rather than representing the gospel. How to be a disciple, how to make disciples, that's the point here. That's the issue. Lose your life for the gospel. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Wow! Even some of the adults remember. A follower, not a fan. Jesus doesn't need any fans, by the way. Read the book of Revelation. <laughs> He's the victor, not a victim. When He died on that cross, He wasn't a victim. That was God's plan. That was the only way that God could make a way where a holy God could be right with sinful men was someone to pay the price for his sins. Lose your life for the gospel. Stop living just for yourself. Being fixed on eternity, not on this world. 
Brothers and sisters, stop being a coward. I preached to myself. Sam, stop being a coward. Stop being ashamed. Be unashamed of the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Be fixed on eternity, not on this world. Stop being a coward. But you know, let's face it, that won't last. You see, you can't do these things, we can't do these things ourselves. <laughs> That's our problem. But thank God we don't have to. Jesus never asked us to do something that He hasn't already done. He will never ask us to do something He won't give us the grace and the power to do it. That's the God that we serve. Sweet promise He left us when He told us to go and make disciples. What does He say at the end? <laughs> Surely I am with you always, even to the end. Even to the end of the age. The promise, He's always with us. And why is that important? Why is that important? Because Jesus, who had it all, who had everything, chose to lose His own life on the cross so that we can gain eternity with Him. Jesus had every right to keep His life for Himself and carry everything. But he carried everything that he had to the cross. He lost his life for us. His eternal purposes were fulfilled. Even when no one's eyes were fixed on him, as Isaiah says, he looked so bad nobody would even look on him. Isaiah says that. When everyone's back was turned on him, even the ones that he was doing it for, Jesus Christ forfeited his soul in exchange for us. And the, and, and the ones being so unashamed of calling him boldly proclaimed who he was, what he was going to do. He took on the shame, our shame. He took on the shame of this world. He took on the full weight of our sin, treated he was treated as if he was a coward. And yet he, he felt the ultimate shame naked on that cross. Even when he felt the silence of his father when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why? For his Father's glory. And for our own salvation. Jesus literally chose these things. And he lived a perfect life. And he took the weight of all of our sin and our degradation. That's how much he loves us. If you ever doubt the love of God. Think about what Jesus has done. Be encouraged today by the truth of the gospel. That we serve a suffering servant king. He suffered. He was rejected. He was killed. But he rose after three days. And he did that so that we could be in a personal relationship with God. Here we have a king choosing to be a servant. So that we could endure and be the disciples, the followers of Jesus Christ. Why does Jesus use such strong language here? I believe it's so that we can boast only in Him. Our only boast is in Jesus. Do you have anything to be prideful about? Do you have anything to boast about? Jesus. <laughs> That's it. So to be a follower of Jesus Christ today. What? To be a follower, not a fan. What are you today? You a fan of Jesus? Folks, being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean just coming to church on Sunday morning. Forgive me, I know I'm meddling now. It means after you leave those doors, we're about to put a sign up out here. I believe Brother Calvin's bought it. It's going to say when you leave the church out here, say, you are now entering the mission field. <laughs> it means what you do every day when you get up. 
It means how you treat your husband or your wife. It means how you take care of your kids. Kids, it means how you obey your parents. It means how you live your life every day. Following Jesus, all we do when we come to church is we worship and we hear word from the Lord. But where the rubber hits the road, folks, is on Monday morning. <laughs> when I wake up, even as a pastor, sometimes and say, Oh, me. <laughs> Life is here again. But remember, you can't do it yourself. Jesus has already done it. Trust in Him. Depend upon Him. Lean on Him. We're going to sing this great hymn, one of the oldest hymns ever written that we sing today. I believe that's right. Be Thou My Vision. This, this, this hymn was written about 400 years ago. But it has a beautiful message. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, let me say, today's your day. Man, woman, boy, girl, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, trust in Him today. It's pretty simple. Not easy, but it's simple. It simply means accepting that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior, and turning from your sin and turning to the only Savior, Jesus Christ, and say, I trust in you and what you did on that cross 2,000 years ago, and I give my life to you. That's all it is. If you've trusted in Jesus, but you never followed him through the, those waters of baptism, that's the first step of following Jesus. You're going to be a disciple. Following Jesus is, is obeying that, because he told us not only to go and teach a disciple, but to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son. If you've never done that, if you're here and God's leading you're, you're a member of another church and God's leading you to be a part of our fellowship here. We invite you to do that too. Let's stand and I'm going to pray.